Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you may be joining from, it's a delight to have you here uh, for this webinar on innovation in higher ed. Lessons from co-design experiences. My name is Ryan Derby Talbot. I am the founder of Reimagining Higher Ed. I've also been the uh, chief academic officer at two startup institutions, the most recent one, Fulbright University of Vietnam, an institution where we indeed ran a design year. So I will be participating in this webinar as a panelist to speak from that experience. Uh, just briefly wanted to tell you, Reimagining Higher Ed is a new organization that's been, that I founded in order to provide resources and community for those who are interested in considering and engaging in innovation. Um, what I found from my own experience is that there are lots of little pockets of innovation that happen in the higher ed world. However, we tend not to know, know what each other is doing. We tend not to know and be connected in these little pockets. Um, and for example, even the panelists, those of us in this webinar, um, had a lot of excitement when we were doing our planning meeting about this because we have so much to talk about from those experiences. So reimagining higher ed is meant to try to provide a sense of community as a, and a forum for sharing lessons that we have learned from innovations that we're undertaking because um, innovation is much more than trying new things. It really is about reflection and lessons that we learn as we try to enrich the educational experiences for students inside of the constraints that we deal with. Um, so this is the first in the Innovation in Higher Education webinar series that Reimagining Higher Ed is running. We have another one, uh, another webinar that will be coming next week on experiential learning. I'll plug that at the end of this webinar. Um, but again, the purpose is to provide some resources and a forum for conversation to share in innovation so that the innovators of higher ed in whatever pockets they may be can connect with each other. For this webinar, we're going to be talking about co-design and just in a nutshell, co-design is the process of doing program development where the students are actually brought in and included, not just as participants giving feedback, but actually having some sense of ownership and authorship in the process themselves. Um, all of us on this panel have used co-design in the year prior to the launch of a new institution, new program. And we've used that co-design experience in what we've called design years. And so students have been pre-admitted and brought in to work with faculty in actually coming up with ideas for the program, testing things out, um, working creatively together. And all of us have been influenced by the pioneer of this idea, which is Olin College of Engineering in Massachusetts. Olin College is the first that I know who ever did anything like this. And in 2001, they ran a design year with 30 students in what they called as partners who worked with the faculty and the founding of the institution. And the provost of Olin College, Mark Somerville says that that's what he thinks is the best thing they ever did at Olin. And the reason is not just because of the new ideas that got produced out of the design year, but what Mark said is the culture that results from having students really engage with the institution as partners. They, there's a community and culture of, of improvement, of trying to make the institution better, of problem solving that provides a refreshing and healthy antidote to the otherwise worrisome trend of the culture of entitlement that we can see on the rise in institutions. So all of us influenced by Olin have recently run co-design experiences for the institutions with which we, are, we have been or are affiliated. Um, and while we will talk from that experience of how we've used this in startup settings, we feel that there are, there are lessons to be learned about co-design that can adapt not only to startup situations, but any institution, including long-standing institutions who are facing questions of change or innovation. So we're here to share our lessons, but not necessarily to say that we know everything about co-design, but in really the true spirit of this topic, have it be a co-inquiry into the question of what co-design makes possible. So that is going to be what we discuss. And with that, I will have our panelists introduce themselves uh, and then we'll continue. Juliana. 
Hi there, my name is Juliana Stockton. I am um, currently the Director of Program Design and Math Faculty Mentor at High Meadows Graduate School of Teaching and Learning. Um, I was, I experienced that partner year that Ryan mentioned at Olin um, as a student. So I spent the year after I graduated from high school um, as one of 30 Olin partners sort of working with the staff and faculty to develop the curriculum um, and other things throughout that co-design year. Went on to a job as a math faculty member at a traditional liberal arts institution and then ended up, um, couldn't turn down the chance to help start up another school um, and became founding faculty member at High Meadows, which was formerly uh, known as you may have heard of the Woodrow Wilson Academy or Woodrow Wilson Graduate School, um, but we recently changed our name. So I'm excited to be here, thanks. Shall I go next? Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is Beverly Gibbs. Uh, I'm Chief Academic Officer at a, a higher institution called NMITE in the United Kingdom. Uh, so um, I joined uh, NMITE uh, last summer, which is about a year after, not quite a year after the design cohort finished. And so I wasn't personally involved in the NMITE uh, design year, but I have been involved in co-design in other organizations that are trying to uh, make significant changes rather than start from scratch. And so I joined NMITE trying to make sense of this very present sort of uh, thing in the NMITE culture and the NMITE might uh, way of doing things that was the design cohort that had disappeared before I had joined and so it's been really interesting experience trying to uncover what that was about and what its aims are and to really um, try and think through as chief academic officer how successful we are still being at carrying through some of that thinking which I think we'll come on to later so I'm very happy to be here thank you Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew McGuire. I currently serve as manager of corporate partnerships at UNICEF USA, but I come to this webinar um, with my previous hat on, which was as a director of strategy and special projects at Fulbright University of Vietnam with Ryan, where we collaborated on many projects together, uh, focused for me more on sort of the student services side of things and how to find opportunities to bring students into that design process. Um, and I'm also kind of currently working on a side project, writing a book around sort of the role of youth development organizations in overcoming some educational inequality. So really excited for the conversation today. Great, thank you panelists. And um, in addition to being the founder of Reimagining Higher Ed, um, I'm Ryan Derby Talbot, I'm a mathematician and most recently was the chief academic officer during Fulbright University of Vietnam's co-design year. So I will be wearing that hat and participating as a panelist in this uh, webinar discussion. And I'll turn it over to Andrew um, to, uh, to, to, to get us going with the uh, discussion. Great, thanks Ryan. And thanks everyone for being here. I even see some of our former students all the way in Vietnam are staying up very late to join us. So we're glad to have folks from all around the globe joining our conversation today. So just a couple of housekeeping points. Um, I see already some of you are using the chat and Q&A functions. That's great. If you have a question for the panelists, if you can please use the Q&A function, I'll be tracking our uh, contributions that way. And we'll save some time at the end to get to a few of those. Um, basically the structure we're gonna use is we're kind of go around the circle here. Uh, folks are gonna draw on their different experiences as we dive into the different dynamics of the co-design experience. So to get us started, I'm going to ask each of you to help orient us to your institution's design experience and give us a little bit of an overview. So, you know, the type of institutions uh, that you were doing this co-design within, maybe some of the folks who were involved, how long it ran, some of those details that can help get us oriented. Uh, maybe we can start with Bev. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, NMITE is a, um, a, a completely new greenfield higher education institute in the UK and they don't come along very often. So it's quite an unusual, unusual thing to be doing to be starting a completely new um, higher ed institute without any antecedents with in a 
in a city and a county that also doesn't have any higher education provision. And so it's a very ambitious project. Um, we are uh, education focused, education and educational scholarship, and we're engineering and technology focused, and, and that's what's in our name. Um, and so um, the uh, aim of the involving students in the design process was to essentially co-design the institution and to embed a culture of student voice within the organization right from the beginning and um, the people that were involved in that there's many of them on the call today so I wasn't there when that happened but you can see people like Helen Rogers, Dave Allen, Sarah Hitt, Neil Rogers please go talk to them directly if you want to know uh, the inside track of how that worked and um, I'm sure they'd be really happy to talk to you about that. Um, and so uh, we had um, uh, uh, 25 students who joined for a year and uh, their mandate was really to uh, start to explore the pedagogy, explore how the, uh, the institution would sit within the city, how it would work with its community stakeholders, uh, uh, how the uh, pedagogy would work, what the learning spaces would look like, what the student accommodation would look like. So a very, very broad uh, student remit. They trialed different kinds of learning experiences spent time in different departments in the organization um, and uh, worked with partners some of whom I think are on the call today as well so um, it was a uh, they weren't pre-admitted in the way that um, uh, some other design years are these were a very different group of people who were recruited um, to actually bring that vibrancy and that very creative approach to being a young person who might want to do something very ambitious with a new institution and bring their perspective to that. So they weren't necessarily developed as a pipeline of future students. It's really helpful. Thank you. Juliana, do you want to go next? Sure. So I'll start with the Olin um, experience where there were 30 Olin partners who were um, as I think Bev put it, pre-admitted, who then folded in with an additional 45 students the following year in Olin's first, um, what became the first graduating class. But there were 30 of us for partner year who spent the year working um, on sort of test driving chunks of curriculum, um, working with faculty, essentially serving on committees. Um, in developing sort of bigger picture ideas of, you know, what order should math be taught in in an engineering curriculum. I should mention Olin is undergraduate only, um, just engineering focused and remains to this day very small. Um, so each class is sort of 75 to 90 students total. Um, the faculty had been working for, I think, about a year before the first group of students came and Fun fact, the Olin partner year was actually um, not intentional, <laughs> um, uh, that they were planning to admit us. Um, they recruited for that first class to start in fall of 2001, but uh, things weren't ready in time. And so part of the why for bringing in students in that beginning phase was um, because there were a bunch of us who were really excited, hoping to apply. And they said, well, we why don't you come now and, and help us get this done? Um, in the uh, High Meadows experience, we had a design fellow year where but there were 10 graduate students. So High Meadows is, um, unlike Olin, exclusively graduate school um, for preparing math and science, middle school and secondary school teachers in the Boston area. And, in our design fill year, which was intentional, thanks to Mark Somerville from Olin, um, we had 10 uh, teacher candidates, prospective teacher candidates we called the design fellows. And they worked with staff and faculty really in developing curriculum and building what we call challenges. It's sort of a challenge-based um, program for teacher preparation. So, the design fellows were stipended for that year um, and so sort of paid for their design work, whereas uh, at Olin, as an undergrad, it was a full tuition room and board scholarship, um, but not like we, we treated the design fellows like they're, you know, working, which they were <laughs> very hard for that year. 
Great, super helpful. And Ryan, do you want to orient us to Fulbright? Sure. Um, if Fulbright University Vietnam is a really ambitious project uh, of launching Vietnam's first not-for-profit private university um, that is meant to be for Vietnamese students, but English language instruction, uh, have an international faculty, um, and also be built on the American tradition of the liberal arts, along with engineering, trying to have those be integrated. So Fulbright was being was, was launched with the decision not to have formal academic departments, for example, and to try a innovative approach to its undergraduate curriculum. And that was the genesis of the design year. Um, also, we had learned about what Olin had done and Mark Somerville um, actually came to Vietnam and helped us understand how to go about launching a design year. So we had 54 students pre-admitted tuition free for that year um, to come and work on the design year with 15 faculty, um, international, some Vietnamese, but um, and then the rest from everywhere else. Uh, and really the questions that we were looking to address were specifically, you know, how do you do a kind of blended liberal arts engineering program for students in Vietnam that still, um, that, that sort of allows them when they graduate to, to fit into the, the world of Vietnam, the jobs that they would look forward to making sense of their program. Um, how could the students transition effectively from the more rote learning environments of traditional Vietnamese education into the more active engaged uh, seminar style teaching of a liberal arts focused program? Um, and then in what ways can we take advantage of the situation of Vietnam to really use that in developing the curriculum? So the faculty and students work together through those years, mostly in teams of about 10 students, eight to 10 students and two to three faculty members divided up into these modules. And about every month, uh, they would be taking on some kind of question, um, could be a curricular question, could be a, something else related to you know, developing the student government and investigate that together and report back to the community uh, some of their findings and recommendations. Um, it's a, a real tension point about, you know, how much to start with, how much do we, you know, give people, uh, the students to kind of start with and how much do they actually input themselves. Um, so at the founding of Fulbright, we had in advance of this, the academic design team of which I was leading had, had looked at several institutions, come up with a basic prototype curriculum that was a general frame that we turned over to the community to, to, to investigate inside of. So they weren't entirely starting from scratch. They had some parameters around it, but we're investigating things. And of course that framework changed over time um, as a consequence, but um, you know, that, gives, that gives some indication of how the year ran at Fulbright University Vietnam. That's great. And I'm sure everyone's struck by how very different each of these approaches are serving different kinds of students to different ends using different strategies. And so we're going to learn a lot both for the similarities here, but also the differences that we took. So, you know, it's easy to talk about co-design at sort of a high level, um, but let's get into some of the nitty gritty. So Juliana, I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about what the design year looks like in practice uh, in your experience. Sure, so um, in during my time at Olin, they, we had broken up um, the year into say six week cycles, sort of modules, which is um, was actually a format that we kept. Um, we repeated again at High Meadows, something very design sprinty about it seems to be a good, good chunk of time. Um, and for those six weeks as a student, I was working on um, like taking one sort of test course um, that faculty had been piloting or had some ideas for. So, so wearing my student hat very literally, um, doing homework, <laughs> turning it in, but didn't count for a grade kind of thing. Um, I was serving on an academic committee task force. So something in this case, I was on the math curriculum committee, which maybe predicted my future. Um, and working with the math faculty and others to sort of figure out the sequence of curriculum across more, more than a specific single course. And then um, all of the students were on some co-curricular student life uh, committee. So we had folks writing the student government constitution. I was on the honor code committee. 
So um, figuring out what Olin's honor code would be. So we did things like um, essentially design research. So visiting other schools and learning about their honor code programs, drafting our, our versions, getting community feedback from the rest of the students, faculty and staff, revising the honor code accordingly. So, um, and then there were community building things. So a big part of the intention of the partner year at Olin was on, um, I think fostering the spirit of um, community and of do learn. Um, and so we, we were engaged in a long-term project to break a Guinness Book of World Records uh, record for the longest Rube Goldberg device. Um, so we were in teams and we took, you know, we're each gonna try and do 15 steps and like get the handoff between each one. Um, we, there was a tissue that never melted under a bar of soap. So we did not in fact claim that record but um, it was an excellent community bonding experience that clearly I still remember uh, 15 years later. So 20, wow. Um, the design fellow year at High Meadows, I'll just briefly mention because it was a little bit different, was more um, sort of all in focus on a single project. And so I would characterize that a little bit closer to course development co-design with students where um, faculty were design leads for a design team of three to four uh, design fellows, grad students, and working on building a challenge, which is our kind of module of curriculum. Um, and so that would involve some amount of wearing their student hats, wearing our faculty hats, like trying out learning experiences, giving feedback, but also doing the research in the first place to figure out what does good assessment look like? What should be included in a challenge teaching prospective teachers about how to do assessment? Um, who should we bring in as a resource for this? Like how should we make it engaging for other teacher candidates to learn about it? So um, in that, year we sort of defined the process as try, learn, try. So um, just get our hands dirty, build, get something, a, a sort of rough prototype, and then they would hold play testing sessions for other design teams to kind of get things tried out with other students um, and then revise it and hope by the end of six weeks we had a rough, rough version of a challenge uh, for the following year. Super interesting. I'm, I'm struck by the, the wide variety of potential modalities of co-design, right? It's a good reminder that it can be as sort of traditional in your mind as sort of a, a clear course design, but then can extend all the way to student government or honor code that the student life element. So that's, that's a good prompt, I think, for us. So I'm curious then, you know, we have some of these co-design years what are the ripple effects? And Bev, maybe I'll turn to you to understand, you know, how does the co-design year inform some of your current and longer term planning as an institution? So that's a really good question. And um, I, it, so I think the first thing to say is that the, um, uh, the uh, sort of image of the design year remains very salient with NMITE. It's something that's talked about on a regular basis. It's still a source of authority. So if something has been discussed, it will be the design cohort said, and that carries an authority within the organization that that is something that we need to try and get, we need to try and stay true to. And that it's, um, it, you know, it's come from the mouths of people who are not us and, and our interpretation. It's actually come from uh, you know, younger people, because uh, that th that is a very different perspective on what we do. So I think um, so. Their presence is still quite palpable. It's 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 perhaps patchy. It's stronger in some places than others. Um, and the people who work with them most clearly have the design group still very much you know part of their thinking when they're making decisions. And and we're discussing different ways of doing things. Um, uh, whereas other people that didn't work for them for such a long period of time, it's less visible in those relationships. Um, so I think that the um, some of the ways that I see it most immediately are in the design of our learning spaces and the pedagogy that we will be using. So in our learning spaces, and those two things are linked together because we have a studio pedagogy, which means that we have small groups of students. It's a very social learning environment. Uh, they work in an environment that has equipment where they're actually doing tasks and then they break off, have a bit of concept work, theory work, and then 
are able to work through the task again. So a very different proposition from having a lecture and then three days later doing a lab and then, you know, in a completely different module doing um, a, a piece of design work. And so that, that pedagogy involves decisions about how the space is designed and used. And we have a very strong guardian internally who guards how that all hangs together in terms of the way that we imagine teaching and what the space needs to look like. And you can imagine that the pressure on that is phenomenal because it's it can be costly, it can be, there can be not space available that we want. And so actually really keeping a hold of that, no, this is what we did, this is how it worked, this is what we talked about, this is how we think that these learners can come together and actually get through the program in the way that we imagined it is is a very powerful thing to have and really really important so that we don't drift away from that um, and also how the uh, how the design cohort used the spaces so they were in sort of a simulated space I would say that is, is a little bit reflective of the spaces that we've actually now built and so seeing them and how they moved around this the space has informed how we have built our, our first big flagship building so that's a really, really tangible way of doing it. Um, and I think that the more um, uh, the more kind of um, it, it, one of the really interesting things that I, I heard a couple of people say recently was they proved that we can do this. So actually what we're looking at is taking students through an accelerated engineering degree, but not asking them to bring in maths and physics. So you have a mixed ability group from very different backgrounds. And actually the my academic colleagues have got confidence that that can work because they've done it with a group of students before. And so that is if you think about the risk that would be involved in that had we not gone through that step it would be huge so actually it gives us institutional confidence to move forward with how we plan to do things super interesting i i know at fulbright visitors would often comment on the the intentionality of the way we use the space and so i think it's something we might take for granted in in co-design process but the way that you sort of expand and use the space to facilitate that learning that process is very intentional so it's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, speaking of intentionality, we can't just dive in and sort of uh, make it up as we go with a co-design year. There is uh, some serious prep required sometimes. So uh, Ryan, I'm curious, you know, from Fulbright's perspective, how did you all prepare for the year? Um, you know, how did it start and then how did it evolve over time? You know, I think it's um, that question, I think a great question because the technical dimensions of the co-design year aren't the hardest part. It's it's the adjustment that everybody has to make from their traditional roles. And what I mean by that is the faculty is their traditional role of the expert and the authority. Um, entering a co-design space means they have to give up some of that authority and work in different ways than they're used to um, or may have ever experienced before. And students are being given this empowerment and it, it's confusing for them too. And so our, our lead up to the co-design year at Fulbright was we, when we hired faculty, the, the faculty hiring process that we created was not the traditional um, hiring process. We actually tried to make it look like a co-design experience. And so when we hired faculty, the finalists, we actually brought them uh, in group interviews and had them interviewing you know, four to six candidates at a time together, where they were doing a teaching demonstration and watching each other's teaching demonstrations with students that we recruited, some potential, you know, we, we put up a Facebook ad in Vietnam and basically said, we, we want people to be sample students for this thing that we're making. And, and so there were real students. And then they also gave um, you know, a, a very open research kind of presentation with students watching each other. But then they also had to design a course together we gave them the challenge of, you know, here you have an hour, put together a course pitch that you're going to give to students that's interdisciplinary, that involves all of you, um, get the students input and adapt. And then we also let them reflect on what they observed from each other during that experience. And what was fascinating is some of the recruits had never, have never, never interacted closely with faculty members from other disciplines in the way that they were doing in this process, let alone in this kind of creative way of thinking of co-design. So the, 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 the interview process itself got faculty members already reflecting on um, the fact that they were being brought in as a team member engaging in a process of development, um, not just as an expert with some content that they had mastery over. 
when the faculty arrived on campus um, before the students, we actually had them run through a design activity together themselves. We did a week sprint. A sprint is this kind of framework from design world that uh, engineers know about and our engineering faculty help, help run, but it's fast work, very tightly coordinated fast work where you create something and you allow it to be a first draft, but it produces a prototype. We had the faculty sit down and do that with the course catalog in a week, starting from scratch at Fulbright. And it was, it was a really good experience for generating conversations, for realizing issues and questions that people had, but also getting people to have a feel for what it's like to do design work, because it's not like a faculty meeting where you know people get to sit back and, and, and sort of offer opinions. There's, there's work that's happening alongside it. So it's a, it's a different kind of modality. Um, and then we, as soon as the students arrived, we realized that we needed to do something that was some general orientation to co-design because everyone was, you know, what does this look like and how does this work and were the students going to be taking classes? You know, what is Ju Juliana said, what hat would they be wearing? So the very first month of the co-design year, we ran what we called a learning to co-learn design module where we had faculty members in teams of two or three uh, cross disciplines working with about 12 to 15 students, uh, maybe, maybe about 12. And, and it was a month of reading learning science literature together of the faculty members uh, presenting lessons. And then at the end of the lesson, what, doing what we called pulling back the curtain and talking out loud about the choices that they had made having their co-teachers ask them questions about those choices. Why did you do this activity? Having students engage in those kinds of questions. Well, what was, what was that activity meant to achieve? Um, and basically trying to give people an opportunity to develop some shared language and vocabulary about what a learning experience really means. Um, and so, you know, being able to sort of identify, think about what it is to give good feedback about how a learning experience is more than just the ability to recite the information. How does it look in this particular way? You know, how does an engineer present an active activity? How does a, you know, how do you lead an effective seminar? These kinds of questions um, and a lot of time reflecting on, on the experience of being a student, being a faculty member to, to give people some scaffolding that really what the purpose of the co-design year was was to investigate questions of how these learning experiences for students can be made more effective. And so giving people a little bit of a framework about how to engage in that. Um, so that's kind of what we did at the start. And then from there, faculty members would, you know, go and work on different things. A lot of course development um, in the modules and a, a total range of some faculty members completely turning things over to the students and letting them run um, and watching what the students can do, which it surprises everybody. It surprises everyone, all, all, I think every time. And then other faculty members trying to dial in very specific ideas they already had to get student feedback in a much more kind of faculty driven way. So there was a quite of a range of experiences, but getting people to, to understand that this was gonna be somewhat disorienting and it really is about learning, the shared learning and how people can find um, the, the basic, you know, their footing with some frameworks uh, is what we did as the, uh, I would say the first, you know, several, the, the, the initiation to the co-design year for everyone. Super helpful and I, we're getting some questions about sort of student preparation and, and sort of how do you negotiate some of the differences in student backgrounds and I think that speaks to one way that you did it at Fulbright, which is, you know, sort of that intentional orientation to some of these co learning processes, which I think is, is really helpful. So, you know, related to some of these questions around how to engage students best, I'm curious, both from Juliana and Bev, you know, how did you involve students most effectively and, and meaningfully. Um, so Bev, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, so the um, uh, I, I, whenever I look at uh, co-design processes, I'm always interested in who designed the process and whether people are just co-opted onto a process that has already been designed by faculty or whether there's some ownership of the process that's in there by students. And it, it, in might there was... Um, there was the way that it was imagined it was going to run and then there was the way that it actually run and the students really got hold of it and were able to say you know actually we think that we can contribute in a positive way and we can create value if you let us go and spend some time in marketing if you let us go and spend some time in fundraising and so they actually kind of the, the, the academic staff and, and the team was so successful in developing that sense of ownership with them that they were able to say, actually, we think this process would work better if you let us go and do 
this and and uh, absolutely all credit to them that they did make that happen and so they they were able to then go and do that um i think that the the other thing that um, our chief executive talks about is uh, how successful the academic team were in co-creating the rules of engagement with the design cohort so that was absolutely something that was developed together and a, a, an example of of co-creation and of course that's where those foundations of, of ownership and pride start to get laid down. And so I think that um, in terms of effectiveness, it's it's about listening and responding to the way that the students think they, they can contribute and about uh, encouraging and nurturing that sense of ownership, engagement, and having a sense of having a stake in what they're doing. That's great. Juliana? Well, now I want to go be a student at NMITE. That sounds delightful. <laughs> um, the, uh, I think just to, to share one additional sliver, um, not fully answer the whole question, but in terms of effectively engaging students in co-design, um, something that I ran into at both Olin and High Meadows is, um, Ryan sort of alluded to that, despite everyone who's there for the design year having signed on to be there for a design year, we are all still largely products of some amount of traditional education systems and sometimes don't realize just how much unlearning there is to do about our default paradigms of teaching and learning um, in order to fully step into that empowered student um, perspective or let go of the faculty expert um, uh, control, for example. So we sort of talk about how it can be hard for faculty to let go, but we've actually also faced students asking, like, could we please have homework and deadlines? And um, we're a competency-based time variable program at High Meadows. So that's part of what part of what goes hand in hand with, uh, we're talking about design years, but also we are each doing design years because we're trying to build something unique, right? We're trying to bring about innovation in higher education. So it's hard for me sometimes to separate the act of co-design from also the fact that we're trying to get people to co-design around doing something new. Um, so it's kind of challenging in multiple directions um, and this pull to the way that people are used to learning what's comfortable for them like um, it's the pull is strong even if you know we had one graduate student in our first year say I knew that this place was going to be weird and unusual and I came here because it was going to be weird and unusual but I'm having a really hard time with it being weird and unusual like just recognizing that it's um, it's a, a different kind of cognitive load um, so I love Ryan's month of learning to co-learn. Um, and I think of the other things, we, we approached supporting students um, through that process almost more as a student life, student support, like emotional mental health support kind of question of like, what does it take for this to be a safe space for you to bring your whole selves, for you to feel free to be creative? What's the community that will bring out the best possible ideas? Um, so that was, that's uh, part of, I think we took the, the lens of making it safe and open so that people could sort of shed, uh, you know, the baggage that they may bring from past experiences consciously or not. Super interesting. I think, you know, what you're talking about has also, um, I wanna bring in actually a question that's been asked, which is a little bit related to this idea of designing around something new. We, we're talking in all three of these examples initially of sort of more startup institutions, right? And one of the questions is, you know, can this co-design model be applied to an established institution rather than a startup? Could you substitute it for strategic planning exercises is something someone has asked. So curious for, for any of you to jump in to ask, you know, while we are talking about examples that were a little bit more startup-y, how could we bring this into a, a more established institution? Yeah. Shall I come in there? 
Um, so I've um, I've used uh, these kinds of pro not nowhere near on this scale or this resource intensive. So the more micro scale in an established university, and you do have to create that mental space around it. So I've had students over a weekend in the summer holidays where you can bring them in. There's not anything going on around them. They're not due in a class at any one point, um, and you give them the resources. And I remember having a really long argument. So this was about to create a part of the curriculum, and I remember having a long argument with my collaborator about whether we needed to give them the form that we would be expected to fill in and I said but they're going to come up with crazy ideas if you don't and they and my collaborator quite rightly said but if you don't give them that form then we'll find out what they really think and of course actually the answer is not in either of those because it's not in what they say it's in uncovering how they think and what they value and how they go about things and that's really where the the learning in these in these student partnerships comes in it's not about finding the right solution it's about creating the space where you can watch the students think and you can learn together and so um, I think that you can do these in established institutions I think that you often want to have different modalities of uh, engagement going on so at the same time is those co-creation things we also had students on change management the strategic planning boards so they were formally part of the governance and decision making process but that more creative work is the more fun bit and you can do that but you have to um, uh, challenge yourself to give them as much room as possible and allow them to design their own process and you can do you can do great things over a weekend it's a really great tangible suggestion of how we can bring that in and there's a related question, I think, and again, it's just, I think, helping folks wrap their head around what this can look like. So someone's asked, you know, what are the most important artifacts of the design years? Do courses, challenges, program structures still exist as they're designed? Is it, is it a process or is it something less concrete? Um, so does anyone want to jump in on, on some of those artifacts of the design year? Ryan? Sure, sure, I'm, sure I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I, that, I think that's a really rich question. And I'll just mention that when we got together, the panelists got together to talk about this webinar, one of the big questions that kept coming kept coming back to is how do we keep the spirit of co-design alive at the institution? Because what all of us found is the tremendous energy of co-design that, that, that gets created from the participation in something like that. Um, you know, there's there's the confusion of it at the start and Juliana's kind of the unlearning components that people need to go through that Beverly just reinforced, I think is is that's some of the hardest work, but that's the truly transformational work that that ends up having faculty members relating to their roles differently and students relating to their roles differently. And then as new people come into the project, how to engage them into that same kind of mindset and how to have them participate readily. Indeed, I know of a Fulbright student right now who is by herself working on creating a co-design course that she can help lead the new students in Fulbright into an experience because she says she's noticing a difference in how the co-design students participate in their classes now versus the other students that come in. And so what's what's challenging is that the artifacts, I think, need there need to be living um, artifacts alongside the sort of residual artifacts that come out as templates. I mean, certainly the courses go on. One of the things that Fulbright uh, really worked on was designing a core curriculum for the first year of the students. And that evolved at, at, throughout the co-design year. It continue, continues to evolve, but you can see the, the sort of tracks or the footprint of the co-design year in those courses. Um, you know, and there's some other things that you can kind of track through uh, the nature of the curriculum, but, but the living artifacts, I think, are the way that people talk and approach problem solving are the ones that are easiest to lose. And one thing I was grateful about is we did use frameworks from design thinking at the co-design year at Fulbright. So we would reference things. I've mentioned one like a sprint before. Um, uh, we, would, we would reference that kind of work or we had other kinds of sessions where we'd use the innovators compass, for example. So there were some tools that we could kind of keep bringing back in with people, but it's, um, it, it fades quicker than I think I would have anticipated. And I think that's one of the things that we all agreed upon. So, you know, I mean, I think all of us would, you'd find the footprint of design in the artifacts. It's in the course catalog, it's in the, it's in the courses, it's in some of the syllabi, it's in the, the stories that people tell, it's in the kind of institutional lore. Um, but more to the point, the, the softer artifacts of the experience are things that I think need some attention. And Olin College, I know, has has continued with a design experience at least once a year where they will they will sort of stop classes and open things up to design 
um, to kind of keep that culture alive, uh, which I think is an interesting idea. Yeah, that really links back to something Beverly said early on, which is how, you know, in your institution, you feel like that that co-design year has authority still in, in certain parts. And I think it's thinking through how do we build that sense of authority for the co-design elements to, to have a lasting influence? And um, I think that continues to be sort of an important and thorny question for a lot of us. So, you know, we have lots of stakeholders involved in uh, the, the outcomes of a design year. And so I'm curious from all of you, what challenges you face in sort of implementing some of those uh, outcomes of the design year and how you, you worked with different, um, different stakeholders. And, and I'll bring in you know, one of the, the participant questions here, which is the curiosity around the feedback you got from faculty mem members in particular as they were involved in the design year. So open this up to any of the three of you to jump in. Great, Juliana. So I have a, a big picture challenge that I think um, that I know we faced at Olin, um, and I think to some extent at High Meadows, where that relates to the faculty feedback um, and also student experience, which is uh, for the startup version of this design year. But I think also anytime you're saying like we're open to a design co-design process, there was the sense that anything is possible. You know, this feeling of like a blank slate. And it turns out that while maybe anything is possible, it is not the case that everything is possible. And at some point along the way, decisions get made and, you know, directions get sort of shaped. And I remember some all in students being pretty disappointed by their second year that they couldn't major in aerospace engineering because we weren't building a, an aircraft hangar. And no one promised them an aircraft hangar, but like in that spirit of great possibility of like the wide open sandbox to play in, um, the, there's that potential that not every idea, can, not every idea, they can't all happen. They can't all coexist. So. Um, I know some faculty left Olin after the first few years who had been there for the design year, maybe because they'd really hoped that like alternative grading schemes would would come through and that just didn't that didn't happen at the time. Um, there was some student pushback on it. I really wanted regular grades and a regular transcript because um, I said this place is already hard enough to explain. Uh, to the rest of the world. Um, please at least give me letters that they'll recognize. Um, the, there are other faculty who left maybe because the, the burnout <laughs> churn of feeling like you're reinventing the wheel all the time, um, that there's a sense that being open to feedback or continuous improvement can mean constant revision. Um, and I think we're, we're working hard at High Meadows now to, to sort of find a middle ground. You know, the pendulum can swing from like being open to changing anything all the time, which gives people a sense of whiplash um, and is in fact quite stressful for students and faculty alike to being too entrenched, which can happen even in like the second year of, well, that's the way we do things here. Um, and trying to find that middle ground of like, what's a schedule of revisions and improvements or what's the parameters under which we would um, consider redesigning and is it different for program structures, program content, program pedagogy? Like what are the different chunks that we might be redesigning at any given phase? Um, so that's a little bit about the kind of challenges I think from both faculty and student side of things. It's super interesting. I think one thing we we said a lot at Fulbright, and maybe Ryan, you'll talk about this, is needing a little bit of a container for the mess to create in. And so I love that phrase, you know, anything's possible, but not everything is possible. I think that can be really helpful in constraining necessarily some of these processes. But Ryan, you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, I just just to add one thing, I think one piece of advice I got early on from an old found faculty member who'd been on the faculty side of, of the experience um, was how do you evaluate progress in a co-design experience? Because if you try to evaluate it by external, you know, the sort of, you know, external accumulation of products, so to speak, 
um, that doesn't capture what really happens at the, the sort of level of co-design. I mean, the thing that the Olin faculty kept saying is how their culture was shaped through the co-design experience. And their curriculum changed a lot in those early years and didn't look the same years down the line as it has in the co-design experience, but the culture had this culture of engagement and ownership in students that was was something that was was important to the institution. And the development of culture is not something that shows up very visibly to those outside of the co-design experience. So when you go through the co-design experience yourself, you can sort of see what's happening. You can see how we saw this at Fulbright when the students were participating in the next round of faculty hiring, where we were doing same again, group interviews with faculty, but watching the students articulate I mean, my goodness, the, at the end of a teaching demo, having a Fulbright co-design student articulate uh, in English really clearly questions about pedagogy and their own learning and experience. I mean, the whole faculty was like, that's what the co-design year produces, is it produces the students that are able to do that. But how do you capture and measure that, um, which is really challenging, because when you are trying to go through a process of change, the question that everyone wants to know is the what. And really what you're developing through co-design is as much the who. Um, and so translating that was, is a particular challenge that I found that we ran up against um, uh, quite frequently. Yeah, that's super interesting. We're getting lots of great questions. So I wanna bring in a, a couple and sort of combine them into one. We have a few questions around how you select and identify the students to participate in this. And so curious a, a little bit about process, but also about sort of the, the profiles and backgrounds. You know, someone has asked about um, students that might not have any prior college experience or, or maybe limited sort of formal educational experience. Um, and then also if there, if there are any biases that show up in this, right? Do we have a bias towards only the, the confident students or maybe that, that extrovert bias? So curious if, if any of you have um, insights into how you went about identifying those, those students. So um, I, I can I, I can contribute something to that in terms of um, uh, the so it's a really in interesting question about who gets to participate in these co-design processes and whether you are claiming that they are representative in any way of the ultimately the 4000 students that you might have in the future. And you're not right because you're not designing for those 4000 students what you're trying to uncover is how students think about their education to recalibrate your own views. And so at NMIT what's always very important what we've continued through to our own selection process for real students is looking for students that share our values. And so that was what was being looked for. We were looking for students that were curious, that had resilience, that had grit, that were creative um, and were passionate about making a change in the world. And in the course scenario, that will be about using engineering to change the world. But here it was about co-creating something completely new. So actually, as so many things are at NMIT, it was a values driven process for us. And that is actually continued in, in hiring our, um, not hiring, uh, in uh, recruiting, selecting applicants for our courses. Great. So, so I, I think it's something that we put so much thought into, but I wonder if it, I wonder how much it really matters in the sense of, um, uh, I almost wish we could have just taken 10 random people it, in terms of getting closer to a representative set of perspectives. Um, the, I will say one thing that is particularly relevant for uh, graduate school of teaching and learning is um, a kind of fundamental belief that uh, people for whom the traditional education system has not worked all that well, so someone whose GPA maybe from undergrad is not that high or um, are in fact probably very well poised to contribute to making a change in um, teaching and learning, right, in the world of education. So um, to sort of be open to a broader range of applicant backgrounds than might sit on a, you know, traditional admissions committee. Um, so that in our design year, we engaged in design tasks as part of the interview selection process. But again, in retrospect, I don't think it, that was all that equitable because people who had prior design experience 
would shine and their, you know, use of post-its on the wall and people who didn't would hold back because they were nervous and didn't feel confident um, expressing their ideas in a new group of people who we hadn't established, you know, a, a safe space with um, yet. And so, yeah, I don't have a great answer except that I, I really think the more perspectives, um, especially the more marginalized perspectives whose voices are not usually heard in the educational design process, like the, the richer um, your results become. Super interesting. I'm keeping an eye on time and I, and I want to get to our last question because I think it's an interesting one, which is for all three of you and it's knowing what you know now, would you do this process again and why? So maybe we can start with Ryan. Yeah, I mean, I think um, knowing what, yeah, I, absolutely. I think that um, in the, the experience is transformational in a way that's hard to, to, to convey um, or to, to get at, I think in other ways. There are lots of tensions that need to be navigated in doing something like this. And I can see the questions that, that people have asked um, reflect some of those attentions. Like the distribution of authority is a huge question and tension that kind of doesn't have a script answer and that's making judgment calls. I was a leader in the experience try, and for me trying to figure out like, when do I answer someone's question with a no, it's this way uh, versus I don't know, you design it was a constant judgment call. And the leaders would, would we have a weekly meeting where that's what we would talk about with each other. You know, I would meet with the deans and we'd be trying to think about how to, you know, how do we answer those things? And so um, it, it takes something to go through it, but the, 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 the perspective that, 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 that what I notice is people end up thinking about what learning means in this really rich hands-on way. And it's not just because there's sort of theoretical frameworks that are, that are accessible to talk about this, but there's sort of this living case study of experimentation and education that becomes a way of asking questions and finding assumptions that I think are difficult to access otherwise. Um, and I think if we're educators and we're really trying to be reflective on the question of what really enriches education, accessing those background assumptions that are very difficult to see that Juliana mentioned that we carry with us from our previous experiences, co-design has the kind of power to wrestle those assumptions from the background that just allows a way of discussing them. And so I'm a big believer that this is a benefit as a learning experience and in particular to faculty members and going through this um, experience. So I, I, I would say yes for the, the kind of, the kind of uh, value one gets about thinking about learning and, and, and finding oneself being a reflective learner from hands-on experience. That's great, thanks. Juliana? Yes, obviously I liked it so much I did it twice. Um, and I think um, what I'm sort of focused on now um, and that I saw in the questions is, you know, it, can it only be in a startup year? I, I don't think so, right? And I think even we're trying to find ways to um, have a design challenge curriculum unit, you know, what would a design semester look like? What would a design, you know, J term or, or winter session look like? Um, Bev mentioned a weekend, right? Co-design weekend. Uh, what are the different sort of spaces and places where students could have a seat at the table, a voice in the process? Um, and, you know, I, I'm really currently just fascinated about the idea of like a design year in perpetuity. What would that mean for an institution to always be bringing in students to help co-design every year? Um, I think great. it'd be really exciting. Definitely, thank you. And Bev, you want to close this out? Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, do I want to, any, any big decisions that I make about the learning experience? Do I want students involved in that? Absolutely, you know, I wouldn't, it would seem, uh, wildly uh, risky and mad to go about that without um, uh, bringing in students where I can. Whether, and I think that the design year was right for NMITE in the way that it was developing and some of those absolutely enormous questions it was tackling about how do we understand ourselves in this city, in the sector, will
will the pedagogy work? But actually, we've I, th I think we've suffered with the with the gap that largely came from the pandemic. Actually, it was nothing to do with the plan that meant that we've not had students around now for 12 or 18 months. And so it's been really hard to maintain that momentum uh, of co-design and, and listening to students and, and putting student voice and and their perspectives at the, at the center of the experience. And so I think that thinking about not only how your your sort of flagship design experience will work, but also what are the mechanisms that trail after that in the wake and designing both of those at the same time um, is, is a good thing, I think. And our design cohort have stayed involved with NMI. I mean, they support us in all sorts of different ways and are at the end of the line. Even I know that and I haven't met them face to face. Um, but, you know, actually having those those pockets of, of getting the learning experience right as we as we launch and as we get things working is important but I'm fascinated by Juliana's com uh, comments earlier about the fatigue that goes with that and the the inability to settle into the learning experience uh, the teaching experience and be comfortable in that it was um it's it was really provocative yeah absolutely well thank you all so much for your contributions it's been super interesting and I want to pass it to Ryan to uh, get us finished I knew we would not nearly have enough time to get into this. Um, I, this is properly the topic of a whole conference. I want to thank the panelists, uh, Juliana, Beverly. Thank you so much for, for sharing your perspectives on this. Thank you, Andrew, for moderating. We will follow up with all the attendees of the webinar with, um, with a link to the recorded version of the webinar in case you want to revisit it. We also have some additional links and materials that we will send out. Um, and I'll just mention at the end that this is the start of a series of webinars we're doing on innovation in higher ed. And so in addition to the materials on this webinar, when I send out that email, I'll also send a link to our webinar next week on Tuesday about experiential learning, where we'll hear from some leaders at institutions that have been doing experiential learning programs for decades now on some best practices that they've learned from that. Thank you, everyone, very much for your attendance and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.